Hi guys and welcome to today's my lesson counseling session. Yes, my face is back as you can see and I'm also wearing my um, unabridged burners shirt um, that I got from Iskar. So thanks again, man. You're the best. Um, and today I am also answering Iskar's challenge to talk about a female character uh, from Malazan. And now I can already see <laughs> the people saying, um, Counselor, you're so predictable. Of course you had to choose a Tistandi character, didn't you? Um, because the character I want to talk about today is Corlat. Um, however, I um, decided to go with my gut feeling um, concerning this. And um, spontaneously, I would say that my two uh, favorite female characters are Corlat and Samar. And now um, Ruth and Bat has already done a video about uh, Samar and Karsa. So I guess I kind of had to go with Corlat. <laughs> and um, while I was gathering notes for this video, I started to think more and more about the Test Andy as a whole. Um, because if you want to talk about a character um, that is so intertwined with the people, then you can't really do that without taking into account the background of those people. So um, I felt like I had to discuss my uh, view on the mentality of the Test Andy first. And that's how my audio essay on the Test Andy and depression originated. So... If you haven't watched that video or rather <laughs> listened to it, then I recommend that you do so because I uh, feel like um, it's an important backdrop to understand where I'm coming from with this video about Corlat today. We are introduced to Corlat in Gardens of the Moon. And uh, while this is only a very short scene, it is important because it sets up her character really well. And now if I was asked to um, define in one sentence what Corlat's storyline is about, then I would say um, it is a cycle of life and death that is fueled by hope. And uh, hopefully soon you will understand what I mean by that. So um, we get to know Corlat for the first time at the end of Gardens of the Moon when she and the other Tist Andy... Um, pursue uh, Vorkan and Relic into the Asaf house and then Korlat says the quest for vengeance is ended. The Asaf will not be touched for it is new, a child. And then she also says to her brother, cherish such flaws dear brother for our queen's was hope and so is mine. And so the first thing that we see her do is to decide against vengeance. And that's important because the theme of vengeance is intertwined with the history of the Tist Andi. And it is also the theme of vengeance turning to grief and the other way around. So it starts out with um, Rake swearing vengeance in um, Forge of Darkness. Um, and it starts with vengeance and it ends with grief. So... Um, when she actually does go on a quest of vengeance against Kalor, it does end with her brother's death. So we have grief again, but yeah. Um, and then also she says that her flaw is hope. And that is important because it sets her apart from the Tistandi, um, who are in many ways defined by their melancholia and um, their nemesis despair. So um, it's important to keep those two aspects in mind. Now, um, we get to know Corlat a lot better in Memories of Ice, where she's also, yeah, probably almost a main character, I would say. And uh, from the beginning, she is on the side of the Maibi and Silver Fox. And again, she is supporting a child, like she did with the Asath uh, that was still young. And I think that is quite interesting if you consider her own backstory, because um, in Fall of Light we learn that Corlat was actually the result of a terrible atrocity and that of Draconis basically, yeah, doing, or Draconis finished rather, it's, it's a little weird that scene, 
basically pulling out those babies from Sandalath and then one baby is Korlat. Um, and then what is also interesting is that Sandalath then says that baby is full of love and Korlat kind of is. I, I mean, she is a, a kind and nice person, but... And then Sandalath, of course, because of the trauma that she experienced, um, isn't able to accept her child. And she never really accepted her as, as her daughter. So Kolat is still able to support a child despite that personal background. And um, then she is immediately drawn to Whiskey Jack, um, which tells us that she's still able to see the appeal of a mortal. And what connects those two characters from the beginning is that Whiskey Jack is also strictly opposed to a child being harmed. So they are immediately connected by their shared interests in Silver Fox's um, well-being. Um, Corlight is also soon um, put into contrast with the other Testandi as she walks th uh, through the Testandi camp uh, with the Maibi. Um, and that is where the Andy are described as ghosts or as a spectral. They seem indifferent and lost to apathy in comparison. And Kolat seems much more alive. Um, then she also sees no uh, shame in Crone's origin. And she's even looking forward to uh, meeting Quick Ben, even though they clashed. So again, those are points that tell us about her character. Um, and she also doesn't seem to be completely taken by indifference when it comes to getting uh, to know other people because she seems to have a friendship with the Maibi and she immediately, um, yeah, starts a relationship or, well, not, not quite a romantic relationship already, but she's immediately drawn to Whiskey Jack and so she seems to be interested in contact and relationships. And then when the Maibi is um, despairing more and more and uh, wants to end her life, then um, Korlat says to her, I shall not abandon you to despair. So she sets out to help somebody else against her own nemesis. And um, she stays compassionate towards the Maibi, even though uh, the Maibi gets more and more frustrating. And again, that's crucial because if you are dealing with somebody who is struggling, um, it's not always easy to um, stay close to that person and continue to try to help them because a person who is suffering, suffering can actually lash out at you. And that's what we see with the Maibi. Um, but Corlat stays at her side. Um, and then... Uh, when she starts her romantic relationship with Whiskey Jack, she says to him, I would know if you have feelings for me. And that makes it sound a little bit like an endeavor against despair. Because from her perspective, Whiskey Jack is a human. Um, he's already on the older side, which means he doesn't have that long to live anymore. So he's gonna die pretty soon. So um, from a Tistandi perspective, she might say, ah, well pursuing a relationship with him is futile because he's gonna die anyway um, so she could just leave and uh, stay alone but she doesn't do that and what is heartbreaking is that we know that that quest for companionship is doomed to fail but even should we fail we will know that we have lived so um, she is basically living that motto of rake here um, and then um, she also says that it is rare that a Testandi is emerging into the mortal world. And she says to Whiskey Jack, seek my heart and you may be disappointed in what you find. And then Whiskey Jack gives her the stones that he found among uh, those fallen Testandi. And in The Crippled God, we learn that a stone um, marks a gift of the owner's heart. So... Here, uh, Whiskey Jack giving her the stones is actually him giving her his heart um, and Corlett is accepting it. But we also get a metaphor for Etistani's heart, which is a stone. And that is echoed in her words, 
seek not for my heart um, or seek my heart and you uh, may be disappointed in what you find. You might find out that my heart is a stone. And then um, regarding Rake and his actions, um, she is also comforted by certainty. So she doesn't simply believe in him because of faith, but um, he has been there for uh, for his people for millennia. So she knows she can rely on him. Um, then what is also made clear um, in her relationship with Whiskey Check is that she seems to dislike half truths and being kept and things being kept from her in um, close relationships. And when that is the case, then her temper comes through. Uh, we can see that in her interactions with Whiskey Jack concerning the Maibi and Silver Fox. And also when she realizes um, that the Marsons haven't told the truth about being outlawed. Um, then we have the Women of the Dead Seed scene. So she seems to empathize with that situation. Um, she's clearly not okay with people being imprisoned in a sword um, but she doesn't oppose Rake and maybe that's also because she's just more used to Dragnipur being unsheathed and maybe she just also knows that um, it's necessary for Rake to uh, kill people so that the wagon can be pulled um, but she also clearly uh, comprehends Whiskey Jack's struggle um, during that scene. And when um, Whiskey Jack is then struggling with himself because uh, his soldiers saw him kill the women of the Dead Seed, she reminds him of his courage um, to face the consequences of killing. And she also calls him out um, to not feel shame because his soldiers have witnessed, because she says they comprehended what he did. And so did she, of course. Um, and then when uh, we also get to know the Talan Ai, um, she says that within these wolves I see sorrow, eternal sorrow. And then Whiskey Check thinks, you see in their eyes what I see in yours. And it is the reflection, the recognition that has shaken you. So, so that is again a reminder that despite everything, Korlat is still a Tistandi who is in many ways defined by sorrow, despair and melancholia. So yeah, if we kind of summarize uh, what we have learned about her so far is that she appears to be in a little bit of a mediating position and she seems to be able to get along with different groups of people relatively well. So she speaks for the Tistani and she interacts with Cullen and Brood a lot, but she's also kind of that um, connecting person between um, Brood and the Malazans because she gets along with Whiskey Jack pretty well. And we also see her um, blooming relationship with other mortal characters. Now of course we don't know what she was like before the events uh, from Gardens of the Moon and Memories of Ice while the Andy were living more isolated in Moonspawn but from the little hints we get of the other Andy she seems a lot more alive. And she's actually the only one of the Andy, uh, besides Rake, um, who is actually interacting with people. Um, so she is a heart once a stone made mortal once more. That quote is gonna be important later. And this give, presents us with a theme of becoming alive again among others. And that is echoed from her perspective when she has already been with Whiskey Jack a little. Um, Corlad's attention drifted once more. It had been doing that a lot of late. She'd forgotten what love could do as it threaded its roots through her entire soul, as it tucked and pulled at her thoughts, obsession ripening like seductive fruit. She felt only its life thickening within her, claiming all she was. So she feels life within her being with Whiskey Jack. Um, now, then when uh, Rake is uh, gone and uh, people are unsure uh, where he is and what has happened to him, um, she it is clear that she has no wish to rule her people and she knows that she doesn't share uh, Rake's strength of personality, but she still decides, should it be necessary, she will try to lead the Andy as best as she can. Um, and as I said, she dislikes being things, uh, things being kept from her in a close relationship. And that is also echoed in those memories about her and Rake, um, 
where she remembers that so often she has tried to get close to him and to understand him, um, but he denied her because nobody can really get close to him. And um, when she then she realizes that she cannot abandon the Andy. And she also realizes that there can be no romantic future for her and Whiskey Jack. And to me, this um, realization echoes the metaphor of the Gardens of the Moon. And one by one, gardens died. Or in Korlat's words, the world holds no paradise for you and me, dear lover. And then Whiskey Jack dies. And after his death, uh, before she turns into a dragon, the darkness of the soul is filling her completely with the comfort of oblivion. And oblivion can be seen as a death, maybe. And the life inside her has now been killed again by Whiskey Jack's death. This is echoed in um, uh, The Crippled God, where she thinks that when he died, he left his own stone behind, the dull, lifeless thing that was her heart. So the heart has died. Um, and her despair is also made obvious by how far gone she seems to be with her thoughts. And she seems really distant while Brood is talking uh, to her. And she also seems to be unable to believe in Rake anymore. Um, and she seems unable to find the strength to call him. And then she and Brood are watching that storm cloud. And Brood thinks Moonspawn might be hiding inside it. Um, but she sees it dissipating and it hides nothing. There is nothing inside which again is kind of a metaphor for her at that moment and then despair rips through her and she thinks that drake must be dead even though until then she believed in him and she seems to be called back a little by the uh, mentioning of her brother and then she joins him in his dragon form and then of course the culmination of her story arc in memories of ice is her monologue or those thoughts that she has under moonspawn and before that happens, um, Orphantal calls her out um, that she is just hiding from her pain in her dragon form and that Whiskey Jack deserves more than that. And he, he reminds her that to grieve is the gift of the living. And that is a gift that so many of the Andy have lost and that she should descend to the mortal realm. Remember, that is what she did for Whiskey Jack in the beginning. Um, so her decision to descend and face her pain can be seen as a bit of a rebirth so when she thanks her brother uh, she doesn't only thank him for guarding the sky for her but also for being uh, there uh, to call her back from oblivion so um her quest for companionship and love has seemingly seemingly failed but she is able to feel the pain of life again something that the andy seem to be beyond of and it is here that pain overwhelms her and not despair she has fallen and is alive through it and it is made clear in that quote uh, when she's standing under moon spawn um the dead and the abandoned a wash of deepening colors as if in the rain the scene so softly saturated was growing more solid more real no longer the faded to blow of a just andy's regard life drawn short to sharpen every detail flush every color to make every moment an ache. A heart once of stone made mortal once more. And then um, her storyline continues, of course, and she still has tasks ahead of her. Um, the Andy have now later, we're talking about the uh, time uh, in the crippled god, of course, they have now uh, returned to Kakanas. Her brother is dead, but still um, she is forming new re relationships um, that enter her world in the form of Namander and Yantovis. So her mother will not accept her in the end. She knows that and she will not seek her out when Sandalath is uh, sitting on the throne of darkness. Um, but she has found a new house among the Sheikh and also kind of a new family with uh, Namander and his siblings. And... Um, then I want to talk about the epilogue of The Crippled God, of course, uh, because despite everything, Corlett wouldn't be a just Andy if she wasn't also plagued by doubts. Um, and she's wondering if Whiskey Jack might have left her through Hood's gate and if she has just imagined that relationship to be more than it really was. 
and um, her uh, memories and her grief have been um, struck awake by her seeing Whiskey Jack's squad again. And then she is considering giving up that um, stone that she has collected um, for Whiskey Jack um, at the Barrow. And uh, luckily we have the squad coming through and Fiddler and Hatch tell her that Whiskey Jack is waiting for her and that he will wait for her forever if he has to. Um, now, it might be easy to wonder here how she can act like that and how she can think that um, he has given her up. And um, But I don't think that she's being stupid here because grief can lead you uh, to have irrational thoughts and um, it's possible to feel frustrated, doubtful or even angry about the person who has left you. And also keep in mind the um, Tist Andy personality that I mentioned in the um, Andy and Depression video. Um, so uh, to her it seems like in retrospect her time with whis Whiskey Check is a dream and that it is too good to be true. Um, to find somebody who loves you that much after so many millennia. And uh, questioning good things that happen to you or... Rating them as highly unrealistic is a very depression thing to do. And also it's important to understand the significance of her giving up the stone because it would negate her coming to life again. But luckily we get sort of a happy ending because Fiddler calls Whiskey Jack back one more time. And I just love that final sentence. Um, when she reached the road and saw her beloved standing on the hill before her, Corlat broke into a run. I also had that in my most emotional scenes and it made me so happy. And I cried happy tears when I read this for the first time and actually while I was doing research for this video as well. Um, so in the end, of course, she is reuni reuniting with him on the hilltop where she will find him. If you remember Memories of Ice where his um, corpse was also on the hilltop. And then I want to uh, bring your attention to the songs that Fiddler plays. They are called My Love Waits and Gallant's Hope. So of course, My Love Waits for you, uh, for her um, on, on the hilltop, but also Gallant's Hope. Remember, her story started out with the mentioning of hope in Gardens of the Moon. And now with her running towards her lover, it ends with hope. The circle is closed. And um, we even have a bigger circle um, that has been closed by Corlat, and that is when she kills Kadagar Fant um, at the Battle of Lightfall. And Forge of Darkness starts out with the words, there will be peace. However, Forge of Darkness asks the question several times, will there be peace? We don't know, how will it end? And then Kadagar actually calls upon the custom of hostage, which we know from Kakanas. But Kola denies him. And then she confirms, there will be peace on behalf of the Tistandi. Welcome to darkness. Yes, this is such a major that's my girl moment. But also, it means that the Tistandi are home now and darkness reigns again. There is peace and the circle is closed. Okay, that was it guys. That was my video about Corlat. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm really curious to hear uh, your thoughts about Corlat, so please tell me what you think in the comment section. And I will see you next time. Bye!